This video contains conversations of sexual abuse, torture and death. It is highly recommended that you are 18 years or older to watch this. Hi everybody, welcome back to True Crime Tuesdays. I'm Holly. If you like true crime, then this channel is for you. So today's video is about a 16 year old girl in Japan called Junko Furuto. Junko was a popular girl in school, everybody liked her, and she even caught the eye of the she even caught the eye of the school's bully. His name being Hiroshi Minato. Minato. Just a quick side note, if I get any of these names wrong, please don't be offended. They are all Japanese names and I am British, so <laughs> I just don't want anybody to get offended because I'm being crap at names that are in the Japanese. Yeah, so Junko caught the eye of the school bully, um, Hiroshi Minato. Minato? Hiroshi Minato? They're the two main names of this story. There are three other main boys, but I'm not going to mention their names because they're quite hard. Um, so anyway, Hiroshi had a little bit of a crush on Junko and he asked her out and basically Junko said no. Now, Hiroshi didn't like this. He was the one who bragged to everybody that he was part of the Yakuza, which is like a gang, like a big gang in Japan, big scary gang, and everybody was afraid of them. Everybody was afraid of Hiroshi. On November the 25th, 1989, Junko was riding home from school on a bicycle when somebody jumped out, a boy jumped out of the bushes and kicked her off of a bike. Now this obviously, it would upset anybody. And Hiroshi was across the road and he saw everything and he came to help Junko. So Junko was like, well, I know him, so I feel a little bit calm, calmer, a little bit happier. So, and he offered to walk her home, which is nice, nice boy walking her home, um, which she accepted until Hiroshi led her to like a big abandoned warehouse. And this is where Junko's 44 days of hell um, started. And guys, it gets bad. It gets really bad. It gets really dark. This story has creeped me out. So anyway, he takes her to this warehouse and this is where he sexually assaults her twice, like full on sexually assaults her. I can't say the R word because of YouTube. Um, but yeah, he sexually assaults her in this warehouse, not only once, but twice. And then he rings his three friends who tell him to save her for them. And I think these boys were like the same age as Junko, if not a couple of years older, 16 and 17. I just think kids are really, really evil. I really do. I don't have children myself, but I just think they're really evil. So he takes her to the local park where he meets up with these three other boys and they take it in turns to sexually assault her as well. And then they get this plan into their head you know, boys being boys, I'm going to take you back to my house. Mm hmm Yeah. So they take Junko back to Hiroshi's home. Junko is told to pretend that she is Hiroshi's girlfriend. And if the parents ask, then that is her story. Which the parents believed. And that Hiroshi, uh, that Junko was just staying there for a bit. Over the 44 days, Junko and his friends would invite more and more men, boys, whatever, into their home to do bad things to Junko. Now, Hiroshi said that he only did these things because he wanted revenge and because she was pretty. No, mate, not a good excuse. So over in the end, over 100 people were involved in this mass torture and we'll get into what they actually did to her in a bit on the 27th of november 1989 just two days after she went missing junko's parents rang the police and obviously this spooked hiroshi and his friends so hiroshi hands her a phone tells her to ring her parents and tell them that she's run away so junko does hiroshi also tells her to tell her parents to call off the search by the police so she does the police get called off and that would have been one time that she basically stopped the search that could have saved a life 
But what do you do in that situation? You've got four four boys and other people coming in and out to do bad things to you. And they're saying, well, tell them. If you turn around and say, no, I'm not going to tell them. I'm going to say, help. I'm a hero, she is. They will probably just kill you straight away, right? I don't know. At some point along this story, one of the other boys that they they've invited like not the not the four initial boys one of the other boys f feels a little bit guilty about what he's done he's obviously sexually assaulted her he said that he was forced into it so he goes home feels guilty he confides in his brother and tells him look they've got this girl captive and everybody's sexually assaulting her and i i've just had to do it he goes home confides in his brother and his brother tells his parents and then his parents obviously ring the police. Now, this is the point where I think that the police didn't really do a lot. I would hope that the, well, I know that the British police would do a little bit more. But the police in Japan went to Hiroshi's home and knocked on the door and the parents answered. And they've said, we've had a report of a girl that's being, that's being held captive here. And people are, and parents go, the parents just say, there's, there's no girl here. Well, you're quite welcome to come in and... Uh, Come in and check if you want. And the police are like, no, it's all right. If you say there's no no girl here, then there must be no girl here. Why would why would they invite us in if there's no girl there? And, you know, it just seems a little bit strange that, well, they've had a report from somebody who's been in the house and done these bad things to say that there's a girl. There's a missing girl in the house being tortured and sexually assaulted that... I'd, I'd imagine some police would have just gone in, right? Maybe it's not in Japanese law. Maybe that's not how the Japanese are thingy, trained, I don't know. I would have gone in. Although, and the parents that answered, Hiroshi's parents answered the door, they said they didn't say anything because they were that scared, knowing that it, their son was attached to the Yakuza and they were just scared for their lives. So he must have been like a proper hellish boy or this Yakuza group must be really bad for them to be that scared. I don't know. Maybe Junko would be still alive if they had just gone into that house. So another chance of being saved. So to the extent of Junko's um, horrible, horrible 44 days and all of the injuries that she sustained from these horrible people, it was bad. This was a year after I was born, nearly exactly a year. I'm born on the 21st of December, 88. This took place for 44 days from the 25th of November, 89. And you just think to yourself, how many people have these Yakuza gang people kidnapped and tortured and whatnot if a 16, 17 year old boy thinks that that's that's all good to do or was he mentally ill was he who knows so i'll give you a quick round up and then afterwards i will list all the injuries after 20 days junko couldn't walk due to the severe burns that she had sustained from these people just 20 days i'm shocked after reading what she went through that she lasted 20 days if i'm honest she must have had some strength in her and it is reported that after a while, Junko was begging them just to kill her because she just didn't want to be alive anymore. The things that she was, they were doing to her were just terrible. After 30 days, Junko was unable to urinate due to the internal damage that she had sustained from her injuries. And like I've just said, she would often beg the boys to kill her because she just didn't want to live anymore. She didn't want to go through that horrible torture she was going through. The boys said it would take her about an hour to get to the toilet, an hour, literally just down some stairs and across the hall. Imagine how far you can walk in an hour and it took her an hour to get to the toilet. So they tortured her more and more over the next couple of days and she became doubly incontinent. This is when the boys just lost all interest in her. They didn't want to keep her around anymore because she smelled. Her insides were shutting down. Her organs were shutting down. She was obviously going to the toilet on herself. She would throw up all the time because her body would just reject the food and the, the tiny bit of food and the tiny bit of water they would give her just to keep her, you know, just to keep her alive, just that little bit. On the 43rd day, one of the boys invited Junko to play Mahjong with them. I don't know if you've ever seen Mahjong. We used to have a version of it in our 
in our games pile when I was younger. Um, so she accepted, obviously, what else could she do? If she declined, then would she be beaten more? Who knows? And she won. Bearing in mind she's close to death, she won and this pissed them off. So do you know what they did? They set her on fire. They set her arms, legs, torso and face on fire. Do you know? Uh, not only did they set her on fire, they beat her with a barbell as well. Honestly, I've never heard an adult do such terrible things as they did to this girl. Never mind a 16 and 17 year old girl, uh, boys. So Junko sadly passed away the day after this took place due to shock. And they put her in an oil canister, filled it with concrete and took her to Koto. Koto? I think that's how you say it. I don't know. It's a, it's a place in Japan. And do you know what the worst thing is? It's alleged that Junko Furuto was pregnant when they found her. Even though her insides were shutting down and the torture that she'd gone through, she had a little baby inside of her. It wouldn't be that old, but they, she was pregnant. Have I been saying Junko Furuto? Fuck. Junko Furuta. God's sake, Holly. So that is the story of Junko Furuta. Um, if you are a little bit squeamish, don't want to hear what torture she sustained and what they did to her, then please um, exit the video now. Thank you so much for watching. Please join us for the next one next week. Um, it won't be as bad as this one. I know all murder is bad and torture and whatnot, but this one's really, really dark. So next one won't be. I hope to see you there. Please subscribe and I'll see you later. If you do want to hear what she went through, then please stay tuned. I'm about to list everything that she went through. Prepare yourselves, get your tissues ready, sick buckets, whatnot. It might make you want to be sick. So, during the course of 44 days, Junko sustained horrendous injuries and was subjected to horrible, horrible torture by these boys. There was the four boys to start with, including Hiroshi Minato and suspected 100 other men and boys. She was humiliated and kept naked most of the time. She was sexually assaulted both in the vagina and the anus. More than 100 men were believed to have sexually assaulted Junko during these 44 days. It was estimated that she was sexually assaulted to the full extent of sexual assault over 500 times while she was in capture. In captive. And she was sexually assaulted by 12 different men in one day. They hit her with golf clubs and they bashed her face against the concrete floor. The hundred men that uh, sexually assaulted her also urinated on her while she was laid on the floor. They just pulled out their weenie and pissed all over her basically. She was forced to masturbate in front of uh, these men to turn them on. Oof. She had things such as bottles, chicken skewers, um, iron bars, scissors, roasting needles, shoved up her vagina and her anus. They only fed her a limited amount of food and water. She was forced to eat living cockroaches and drink her own urine. They put fireworks in her bum, in her anus, and set them off. Her left nipple was ripped off with a pair of pliers. They would drop dumbbells on her stomach while she was laid down tied up and this is what caused her to lose control of her bowel. She was hung from a ceiling and used as a boxing bag for all these men or a punch bag as we call them now. They would force her into the freezer and keep her there for hours on end. They would burn her eyelids with hot wax and lighters. They would pierce her breasts with sewing needles. Not her nipples, her breasts. Her vagina and her glitteris were burnt with cigarettes and lighters. At one point her captors were sleeping and she managed to get to a phone and try to ring the police. She was caught and she was set on fire and her feet were set on fire. A glass bottle was shoved up her anus and causing horrendous internal damage and really bad bleeding. She had severe leg burns obviously from being set on fire she couldn't hold anything because her hands were so swollen and burnt and her nails were all cracked from dehydration. 
and obviously this took place around winter and we all know in Japan it gets to the minuses in winter, it gets freezing cold, they forced her to sleep on the balcony. At one point they had a lamp that was on, obviously the bulb is hot in a lamp and they inserted it into her vagina um, and waited for it to smash inside of her. So the names of these boys, the first four boys that were, um, they were arrested basically and their names, one was Hiroshi Miyano, he was 18 years old at this time of the crime and he, when he got arrested, he's actually set free now I do believe and he's changed his name to Hiroshi Yokoyama. I'm sorry if I'm not saying these things wrong. Second man was Joe Agura. He was also 18 years old at the time of this crime. And he changed his name to Joe Kamisako. There was another one called, uh, I've been saying Hiroshi Minato all the time. It was Hiroshi Miyano. And there was a boy called Shinji Minato. Shinji, Shin, Shinji Minato six, was 16 years old at the time of the crime. Some sources refer to him now as Nobuhu, Nobuharu Minato. And then there was Yasushi Watanabe and he was 17 years old. So jo Jose Kamisako was released in August 1999. He went back to prison in 2004 for seven years for beating a man up because he thought he was trying to look it's that freaking word again lure his girlfriend i can't is it lior lure lior yeah frick trying to coax his girlfriend it is reported that one set of the parents i think it was hiroshi's parents had to pay junko uh, Furuta's parents so much money because of this because they basically stopped the police going into the house and which led to her death um so they had to pay her quite a lot of money pay them quite a lot of money for all of this and i don't think any of the other boys parents had to um but my god let me shut my laptop it just makes you think how sick people can actually be that is obviously i've been into true crime for quite a while Oh, for years, in fact, and I always wanted to be a scenes of crimes officer. Never got there because obviously life gets in the way. Um, but it just interests me and I don't think I've ever read one that is that shocking. And honestly, it's creeped me out a little bit. Get boys that are all big and hard, but you never think that they could actually be capable of doing something like that. I don't know. What do you think, guys? Leave your comments down below. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about this. Anyway, that's it from me for this time. If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I upload every Tuesday with a new crime. I think next week will be the Wineville Chicken Coop murders, I think. I'm not sure. Not 100% sure. But yes, I shall... Uh, it's either that or the Night Stalker. That's it from me. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please do subscribe. Please do comment down below. Nice things only. Please give us a big thumbs up and I will see you all next week. Bye.